Please open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 9. We will be starting in verse 14. Today we begin a journey through the parables of Jesus. Jesus used parables to teach, says later in Matthew. All these things Jesus said to the crowds in parables, indeed, he said nothing to them without a parable. And so the word parable does come, we do find it in scripture, and of course it is a Greek word in the New Testament that we have translated into English. It is actually an ancient, ancient word that goes back that is meaning to compare and what parables are or what parables do is Jesus wanting to preach theological truths. There are understanding barriers. If you read about the disciples and you read about Peter and you read about Paul believing the wrong things and those who believed in the New Testament Jesus couldn't just pull out a whiteboard and start diagramming the new covenant, for example, and saying, this is what I'm here to do to create a new covenant. Instead, he talks about shirts and wineskins, and hopefully, and we see that this is true after the Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost, they have a remembrance of these common everyday items pointing to great theological truth, and so that is one reason he uses parables is for our memory. There are other reasons he uses parables, which he will uh, talk about and explain to his disciples. Some uh, parables are really short. We would call them illustrations. We would call them uh, something to illustrate uh, a metaphor, a simile, things like this. For example, in Luke it says, How would you say to your brother, Brother, let me take that speck that is in your eye when you yourself do not see the log that is in your own eye. You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Specks and logs is not what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about self-examination and correction. But it is an illustration, but it isn't a story, okay? So what Bible scholars who need to be published have done is they have said, well, if it's a story with kind of a plot to it, then it's a full-blown parable. But if it's something like this, then it's a parabolic saying. Because before, if you read here, it says Jesus only taught in parables, so somehow this has to be a parable, so it's an illustration or a parabolic saying of Jesus as opposed to the Good Samaritan, which is a full-blown story with a plot and character development and all this kind of stuff. So there are different levels, different strengths, if you will, in the various teaching styles in Today's passage, it is only three verses, but it talks about big things. What I shall attempt to do is deal with the who, what, where, and why of the parables. The who is always going to be Jesus. We will always be looking at Jesus speaking. But why did he speak? What did he say? How was it applied when Jesus talked back then? How is it applied today. You may wonder how we, how we know that there are parables in the Bible. Uh, it says in Luke 5.36, he also told them a parable. So sometimes, quite often actually, uh, the biblical authors will tell us, hey, it's a parable, we're coming to a parable, and so we can pay attention and we can know what is going on here. This particular parable um, is the first parable that Jesus taught. And you say, well, how do I know that? Well, there are things, there are um, books called Harmonies of the Gospel. What people who understand the original languages have done is they have published books that I have four columns, one for Matthew, one for Mark, one for Luke, one for John, 
and then they take every single verse out of these four Gospels and put them in an order that they can determine by comparing and looking. John was arrested here. John wasn't arrested here yet. Things like this. They can put them in order. So I have a harmony of the Gospels, and I just look for the parables, the words of Jesus in red, and they will take them in the order. The same is done with the miracles and what we shall do after we look at the 40 or so parables that are in the Gospels. We shall look at the 40 or so miracles in the order that Jesus uh, did them. And we know from the Gospel of John, for example, that changing the water into wine at the wedding it says right there, this is his first miracle. So there are hints in Scripture. It is believed that this was the first parable that he talked about. The setting of this, the why he talked about it, Jesus is very early in his ministry in the Gospels. He is calling his disciples. He is just called Matthew. Matthew is a tax collector. Tax collectors were the devil incarnate to the Jewish people. And as we're approaching May 17th, don't think that about our tax collectors. They can still be saved and work for the IRS, okay? That... There is an, a, a, a sense coming that this is early and Jesus is going to start his teaching. So he calls Matthew. Matthew is a tax collector. He then goes to the home of a tax collector in the first part of Matthew 9. It doesn't say that it was Matthew's house, probably Matthew's friends. And he's with uh, sinners. He's with tax collectors, prostitutes, poor people people that the Pharisees did not like, people that the Pharisees were considered unsavable, and Jesus is going to them, and they, and they criticize him in one of the Gospels, and Jesus says that you don't call a physician if you're well, you call a physician if you're sick, and these people are sick with sin, and Jesus is the physician, the calling Jesus a physician and sin a sickness is a parabolic saying. It is an illustration. It isn't a full-blown parable. And so, what is going on here? You have John the Baptist, who came before Jesus. He is a forerunner of Jesus. He called disciples, and he gave them the command to repent. His baptism in the book of Acts is called a baptism of repentance. So John the Baptist was preaching the Old Testament law, and he was saying, you need to straighten up, you need to get into your Bible scrolls, you need to understand what the law is, and you need to do it and stop being selfish and self-centered, was John's statement. By this time in Matthew 9, you have John already in prison. We don't think that he had been executed by Herod yet, but he is already in prison, and either Jesus is still in the house, we don't really know where Jesus is, but it says the disciples of John, John the Baptist, came to him saying, why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And the difficulty with John's teaching and John's baptism as opposed to our teaching and our baptism is that when John, the teacher of repentance, was put in jail, his disciples did not have the constant accountability and input into their lives to repent. Also, the teaching of John does not save. If you just followed John the Baptist, if you just repented to the Old Testament law with no thought of Jesus, you would not be saved. So his teaching did not save. A lot of acts with Peter and Paul going out into the world was finding people who had been baptized in John's baptism, teaching them about Jesus, and then rebaptizing them into Christ. And so 
When John is in jail, they can't go, there's no visiting hours in the old Roman jails. They can't go and ask questions, so they ask Jesus. When John first saw Jesus, he told his disciples to go follow Jesus. John, for example, John the Apostle, was a follower of John the Baptist. John said, there's the Christ, go follow him. And John did, as one example of somebody who went. These did not. So they come to Jesus and they say, we and the Pharisees, and whenever you put yourself on the same side as the Pharisees in an argument, you're already going down the wrong path. They said, we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast. And what does it mean? Fasting is not eating. There are a variety of ways to fast. You can fast for 24 hours. You can fast from midnight to midnight, for example. Uh, back in the Jewish way and even today, the day ends and begins with sundown. So tonight at about 8 o'clock when the sun goes behind the hills... It is now Monday, even though in our accounting and according to our watches, it is still four hours of Sunday left. The way that the Bible is written in the Old Testament, the way Jews believe even today, is that the next day begins when the sun goes down. And so they would have a fast from sundown to sundown. That would be a full fast, a full 24 hours. They would also have a partial fast, which is from sun up to sundown. So you could eat a big breakfast, you could fast for 12 to 16 hours, and then you have a big dinner, and that's considered a fast according to Jewish traditions. If you read through your Old Testament and go page by page, get out your concordance and find the word fast, in the Old Testament, there is only one command from God to fast. Only one day in the year on Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement, which is the day that the priests would take uh, the goats and they would sacrifice a goat for the entire nation of Israel on that one day. The entire nation of Israel would be atoned for through that ceremony during that, while that is going on, the people of Israel were supposed to fast, to show humility, to try to get closer to God. The point of a fast is, if I deny myself physical sustenance, I can learn to rely on God more and grow my faith so that believing that God is the provider of everything that I have. It is a way of focusing somebody spiritually. It is a way of focusing prayers because you're learning to ignore and deny yourself. What the Pharisees had done these many centuries after Moses was that they had expanded fasting to twice a week. They believed that it was a way to earn benefit from God to get God's attention, and to earn blessing from God. And so they would fast twice a week. Jesus criticized their fasting, saying that when you fast, don't look all gloomy, don't look hungry. Okay, What the Pharisees apparently were doing was, whether they were fasting or not, they were looking like they were fasting so that people would see them in the marketplace and they would say, what a very spiritual person that is because they're fasting twice a week. The, the fasting that is supposed to bring about humility and closeness to God was used as a way to get praise from people and to, get, to have people look at you spiritually in the marketplace because the Jewish people were, were a, a spiritual people. Everything was built around God. 
that when somebody looked godly, you would praise them, you would bow down to them, you would invite them over to dinner, you would give them gifts, because if they're really close to God, and you get really close to them, then you're really close to God by the associative property. So there's nothing in the Bible to say you have to fast for Christians. Uh, It's talked about, Jesus says, that once he's gone, people will fast, but if you don't fast, it's not a sin. If you do fast, it's not a sin. It is 100% a personal choice of how you want to relate to God. Some people, even today, get great benefit out of it. Some people have tried, uh, somebody's published, uh, they, they kind of prove from Ezekiel and others, that the Christian fast should be eight days. So there's a book out there called The Eight-Day Fast, and they say that it will just, I mean, you and God are going to be like that after you do an eight-day fast, they claim. If you want to, go ahead. Some people I know have tried that, and they said they got nothing out of it. Other people I know have tried that, and they say their prayers had more power than ever before. Fasting is an option for Christians, and I do not judge you on your fasting, and you do not judge me on my fasting, because Jesus said, keep it a secret. If you're fasting, if you're trying to get close to God, don't spread it around. Don't tell everybody what you're doing. Just do it and make it between you and God, and that is what fasting is today. So Jesus says basically three things about this fasting question. First, he talks about the bridegroom. He calls himself the bridegroom. This is a theme throughout the New Testament and the book of Revelation. When Jesus Christ comes back in the book of Revelation, he is coming back for his bride. The church is his bride. Our relationship to Christ is, is a marriage relationship spiritually. He is our bridegroom, we are his bride, and this is how Christ refers to himself in this sort of illustrative way throughout the Gospels, and then that is taken by the uh, epistle writers for the rest of the New Testament. It is seen as a marriage relationship between the church universal and Christ. And he says that while he's here, while the bridegroom is here, while the wedding's going on, uh, you don't have to fast. You don't have to uh, spiritually stretch yourself because Jesus is right there. I got a spiritual question. I walk over there and I talk to Jesus. But he says he's going to go away soon. And then at that point, He says his disciples will fast. This is not a command for us to fast. It is just something that he is saying is going to happen. Then he talks about the core parable of the day. He says you've got a shirt, and if you're a Jewish person, you only wear cotton and wool, and you don't mix them. Okay, the Bible is clear in the 613 commandments. You got to wear pure clothing. And back then and today, the only way they can guarantee the purity of their white shirts is that if they're 100% cotton. Okay, you see on TV at the Wailing Wall or some Jewish event somewhere. All the men are wearing white shirts, black pants, black coats. Cotton shirt, wool pants, wool coat. They've done it this way for thousands of years, and it is how a Jewish person obeys the commands. The thing about cotton and wool is it'll shrink. You buy a cotton shirt that has not been pre-shrunk, you wash it, and it comes out as doll clothes. It's... (laughs) Cotton and wool will shrink, and we have to be very careful how we wash them. They didn't have that care back then. You just put it in a pot with some lye and stir it around, and bing, you're washed. 
And so if you have a cotton shirt and it's old, you've had it for years, it's been washed many, many times, it's as shrunk as it's going to get, and you get a hole in it. Let's say you burn a hole in it. So you got a hole about the size of a quarter. You can't put the pieces together and sew it. You've got to patch it. He's saying it's stupid to take a new cotton shirt, cut it up, and make it a patch on the old one. Because as soon as you wash it, the patch is going to shrink and all the thread's going to tear and the hole's going to be bigger. In the same way, wineskins. Wineskins were animal skins. Animal skins were used for wine because when you fill them with wine, they, the wine continues to ferment and therefore expands. And wineskins are flexible such that they can expand and contract as the wine is fermenting and then poured out and such and such. The older the wineskin, the more brittle it is. It will not expand. The older the wine, the less fermented it is. It won't produce any gas. So old wine is for old wineskins, but if you have new wine that's still fermenting, you need new wineskins. You need something that can withstand the expanding and contracting of the wine. And this is the parable. And so Jesus just throws that out and then he starts talking about something else. What did it mean? The Pharisees, if you read your Old Testament, you will get the commands. You'll, you'll go through Deuteronomy mainly and you'll get a command here and a command there and you'll just see commands everywhere. And if you read it and follow it, you are righteous and holy. Paul says that it is impossible. You cannot read it and follow it. Your human nature will not allow it. That's why Christ came to keep the law for us. What the Pharisees had done is they had created three layers on top of the commands of Scripture so that Listening to a Pharisee, it would be impossible to understand what to do. It would be changing. It would be so difficult, no human being could do it. And what Jesus is saying is that while he's on earth, the rigidness of the law is such that if you try to put in uh, you try to put in grace, you try to put in mercy, you try to put in saved by faith through grace, you put in all the salvation truths of Jesus Christ in that old rigid system, it will break the old rigid system. Or you'll say, no, we're not saved by grace, we have to be saved by works. And if you read through the New Testament, there was a group of people called Judaizers who followed Paul around. And whenever he said, you are saved by faith through grace, all you have to do is believe in Jesus Christ and you are saved, which is the biblical message. They said, and you have to be Jewish. You have to keep the kosher laws. You have to keep the holidays. You have to basically be Jewish. And Paul is fighting them in the book of Galatians primarily, saying that is a false gospel, that we are saved by grace. So what Jesus is talking about is a new covenant is coming. A new covenant is coming on the cross. When Jesus is walking around, the covenant had not been established yet. The new covenant that we are saved by was not established till he died on the cross and covered your sin with his blood. He is creating a new covenant on the cross, and once we have that, once we have the Holy Spirit, then all the teachings of Jesus can go in this new wineskin, can patch these, new, these clothes, can do all the things that he is illustrating here and you now have a foundation of belief in the new covenant. And so Jesus talks about this early, 
The new covenant had not been established yet, so this is something that they need to hang their memory on because in three and a half years, when Jesus dies on the cross, they're going to have to remember, aha, so this is a new wineskin. This is a new foundation for our belief. We do not have that problem. We are 2,000 years removed from the establishment of that covenant. So what we have to be careful to do is that we are not legalistic. Legalism is when you say, you have to do this or do that to be saved. You have to live up to and earn God's grace and God's mercy through behavior, through dress code. Back in the day, um, you couldn't be in a movie theater. If somebody saw you come out of a movie theater, you clearly weren't saved because that is something Christians just don't do. And so the idea that we can put weight on people saying you have to behave this way or you have to say these things in order to be saved is not true. We are all saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. He does all the work. He does all the heavy lifting. And there are some, as we have communion today, who say if you don't take communion, you are not saved. That is not true. Communion is a good thing. We call it a special means of grace because when you participate in communion, there's something spiritual that happens that nobody can complain, but, uh, explain, but it has nothing to do with your salvation. You are saved whether you partake of this or not. If you never partake of communion, that is a sin because Jesus said, partake in communion. So you've got to do it every once in a while or you're standing against Christ and his commands. And so Jesus sets the foundation with this first parable that he is creating a new covenant, a covenant that we are part of, a covenant that we are saved by. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the repentance you offer us. And we thank you for this time of communion. We ask your blessing upon this time and upon all who are here today. We ask this through the blood of Christ. Amen. Mm -hmm.